According to J.R.R. Tolkien, Middle-earth is not an imaginary world, but rather an imaginary time period within the distant past of our own real world. The race of men are our ancestors, and the elves, hobbits, and dwarves have all gradually vanished from our lives and phased into myth and legend. The ends have become indistinguishable from the trees, the magic of the world has faded, and the fantasy of Arda throughout the millennia has become the normality of Earth. If, however, Middle-earth is our world, and considering Tolkien's Christianity, when did the events of the Bible take place, if at all? In this video, we'll cover Tolkien's attempt at covering humanity's first fall, which was supposed to be in the Silmarillion until it was removed. Before that, however, allow me to provide a little context. Tolkien has stated that the Lord of the Rings is, at its core, a Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously so in the revision. This statement can be felt throughout the Legendarium. An obvious example is of course the destruction of Numenor, in which the blasphemous island is punished by Eri Ilúvatar and drowned, as the earth is drowned by God in the Book of Genesis. From Numenor escape Elendil and his sons, who maintained their faith in God, while from the flooded earth escape Noah and his sons, who did the same. The descendants of both Elendil and Noah go on to establish great realms from themselves, and their lineage is what keeps their respective people alive. In Elendil's case, the Numenorians, and in Noah's, the entirety of humanity. In fact, in Letter 131, Tolkien explicitly calls Elendil a Noachian figure. Moreover, despite Ilúvatar's distance, his presence can be felt in almost every page of the book, whether that be through characters such as Gandalf himself, or through the, at the time, minor random occurrences that would end up deciding the fate of the world. At the core of the Christian nature of the Lord of the Rings, however, were Tolkien's concerns about mortality, greed, the human soul, and especially the idea of the fall. In fact, in the same letter, he explicitly states that There cannot be any story without a fall. All stories are ultimately about the fall, at least not for human minds as we know them and have them. Falls occur again and again throughout the Legendarium. Melkor and Sauron fall from grace. Men turn to evil, dwarves to greed, hobbits to ignorance, and the elves, arguably the best of them all, still do not escape the crime of killing their kin for the sake of the Silmarils, and escaping the Undying Lands in disgrace. For Tolkien, the fall is what occurs when we stray from the grace of God, and it is only through union with God and his intentions that the fall can be prevented, or rather, mended. With his stories taking place in our world, however, and with the Christian God being represented by his Eri Ilúvatar, Tolkien had to find a balance between our real world's Christianity and Middle-earth's religious existence. As I've covered before, Tolkien opted to remain vague as to the specifics of Middle-earth's religious practices, while maintaining the Christian themes of the people he wrote about. This mainly concerned the monotheistic Numenorians, who, according to Tolkien, worship the one true God, but not in the right way, meaning how God should be worshipped according to Tolkien's Catholic faith. On a personal level, from my own understanding, Tolkien did not believe that the events of the Bible, and especially in regards to the book of Genesis, were meant to be taken literally as events that happened precisely as described, but rather as important stories that revealed fundamental truths about the universe. This means, as shown in the Silmarillion, that even though Arda is our world, he did not recreate the story of Genesis in his own creation myth, nor is Arda as old as Earth is supposed to be according to biblical sources. Rather, he wrote his own version that maintained the spirit of the things he cared about as a religious individual. These things also happen to be the things the Bible deals with as well. Fall, mortality, pride, greed, and power. This is the reason why, even though Middle-earth is supposed to be our past, we do not see at any point the events of the Bible. And even beyond that, despite my commentary on Numenor and Noah, Tolkien did not write the story of Numenor with the copying of the Bible in mind. What he did was write a story based on the truths that he understood as an individual, truths that were intertwined with Christianity. Humanity blasphemed, God punished, the so-called fall. In letter 215, while discussing his dislike of allegory, Tolkien says that, But long narratives cannot be made out of nothing, and one cannot rearrange the primary matter in secondary patterns without indicating feelings and opinions about one's material. Even though he heavily dislikes allegory and much prefers to reflect on philosophical matters through the use of myths, he concedes that it is impossible for someone not to see similarities between two such works, especially if they're contemplating the same thing, and that is even more the case when one of those works, the Bible, has directly affected the life of the man who wrote the other. Within the Silmarillion, when the race of men first awoke in the East, darkness fell upon them and most of them were dominated by evil. 
with only a few managing to repent and escaping to the west where they made contact with the elves. The race of men suffered the original sin, the fall, in those first years after they woke. What actually happened, Tolkien does not tell us in most drafts of the Silmarillion. This is precisely because he recognized that that story could be misunderstood as an allegory. At some point, however, Tolkien did write his version of the original sin and of his world's Garden of Eden. And it is known to us as the tale of Adano, not included within the Silmarillion. Adano, the housewoman of the House of Marlach, was one of the few that had retained the true tale of humanity's fall, and she shared it with her niece, Andreth. The fall of humanity goes as follows. The race of men were born into the world with the first coming of the sun in the far eastern land of Hildorian. They were bare and primitive, and their lives were free and without burden, and they felt the very voice of God within them. One day, a stranger appeared, and he came to them with gifts. He increased their luxury, he housed them and he fed them, and he increased their appetite. Even though they had lived without burdens before him, now that they had received his gifts, they wanted more, but the stranger would not teach them his ways. He wished for them to rely entirely upon him for these gifts. Humanity realized their dependency on him, and the race of men confronted the stranger and asked him for knowledge. The stranger grew angry and accused men of ingratitude, claiming that the voice they felt within them was that of darkness. At that, the stranger left, and he did not return for a long while, and he left mankind distraught, as they had grown accustomed to the luxury he provided, but which they could not produce on their own. The voice of God had tried to warn them repeatedly not to trust the stranger, but mankind did not listen. In the midst of their desperation, the sky grew dark, and the sun vanished. And men were terrified that it was the darkness from within coming to consume them. At that thought, the stranger returned and offered them salvation. The only thing that he asked in return was that they worshipped him as their lord and god. He was the stranger no longer, for now he was the master. The master was not as generous as before, and he only gave gifts when his orders were obeyed and his name revered. With the worship of the master, however, something else also changed. Men started to age and die. This had never happened before. They begged the master for help, and he merely laughed, and he demanded more and better worship in order to protect them from this new curse from death. Some from the race of men realized their mistake, and they attempted to embrace the voice from within yet again. They were put down and burned, sacrificed to the master. This the master did not ask. Men sacrificed other men to the pyre on their own, and the master was shocked pleasantly at mankind's new cruelty. The very few that had managed to survive and wished to rid their soul of the master fled into the wilderness, where they encountered the elves for the very first time. These elves were the Avari, who had rejected the Valar's call to the west, but they told the men that perhaps they could find salvation there. These few men journeyed west, as west as they could, until eventually reaching the land of Beleriand. Upon reaching that land, they realized that the west that the elves spoke of laid out of reach beyond the seas and, more importantly, their former master had a terrible fortress in the far north of this land and that he was named Morgoth by the elves, the black foe of the world. And thus the tale of Adano comes to an end. After hearing the story, I hope now you can see why context was required. Through this story, Tolkien showcases the fall of mankind through the help of the devil and, most importantly, through mankind's greed for more. Where its newfound material wealth, even in the very first generation of mankind's existence, led to men forsaking God so quickly and so definitively, and how this act affected their fall and by extension their physical health too. As you can understand, Tolkien wrote this story while trying to interpret, in the context of his own world, these very important themes in his own life. He realized, however, that by going into detail in such a manner, the risk of falling into the trap of allegory increased. With this in mind, Tolkien's version of the Garden of Eden was scrapped, but the original sin remained. As for him, it would be impossible for mankind to be presented without it. It defines the race of men completely. To accomplish this, he retained mentions of an evil deed and fall that occurred in humanity's very early existence, but maintained that the race of men never revealed it to the elves, and as such, it is not in the Silmarillion. Thus, the original sin remains, but the Garden of Eden does not. Massive thank you to my channel members, and thank you very much for watching.